I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath, my wrath did end. I was angry with my foe. I told it not, my wrath did grow. And I watered it in fears, night and daytime with my tears, and I sunned it with smiles and with soft, deceitful wiles. And it grew, both day and night, till it bore an apple bright, and my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole when the night had veiled the pole. In the morning, glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. <coughs> On the wall of the dining room of the little house where I spent my growing up years hung one of those dreadful paintings of Jesus in which, despite the specifics of Bible stories that identify him as a Middle Eastern Jewish man, he has blonde hair, blue eyes, and porcelain skin. The painting was perfectly attuned to the many non-biblical assumptions we held in rural Texas, namely that Jesus was one of ours, white, middle class, with the only difference being that he wore his hair a bit too long to be a real Texan. <laughs> In the painting, he has a Mona Lisa smile and his skin is unlined, further corresponding to the teachings we learned about Jesus as someone who was gentle, meek, mild, enjoyed the company of women and children and never ever raised his hand or his voice in anger. My parents did a fine job of aligning family values with the values our church presented as those of Jesus. We were not to hit one another, nor raise our voices in anger, though my parents did both whenever my siblings or I disobeyed. <laughs> we were never to fight or argue, never to disagree, never to show any signs of being mad about anything. To do so was to incur punishment and sermonettes about the incompatibility of love and anger. My parents were allowed to get mad. Their anger was justified. My siblings and I, we were always to be pleasant and polite. I told it not, my wrath did grow. It grew both day and night. A combination of adult life experience and therapy subsequently showed me the error of my parents' ways, while seminary training showed me the church error in trying to ignore what I once heard called the biblical God's anger management issues. <laughs> As Blake's poem, aptly titled, The Poison Tree, observes, unexpressed anger rarely goes away. Instead, it simmers beneath the surface, sprouts roots, spreads. To dissipate anger, some expression of it is usually needed. Again, in the Poison Tree poem's words, when the speaker told my friend of his wrath, that wrath did end. But this is all common knowledge to Unitarian Universalists, isn't it? We've discarded those dysfunctional anger images from some traditions, those images of hell and punishment, the wrath of God, the last judgment, stoning of sinners, scapegoats, sacrificial appeasement, and white bread and mashed potato Jesuses who never get mad about anything and also never stand up for themselves, never show a healthy self-assertion. Ours is a pretty straightforward spiritual style. We tell it like it is, regardless of whether anyone pays attention or wants to hear us. We confront directly anyone we disagree with and let them know our disagreement. We critique, we greet authoritative religious pronouncements with skepticism. We tell our friends when we are angry and our wrath does end sometimes, <laughs> occasionally in a few select circumstances. <laughs> I 
I was angry with my foe. I told it not, my wrath did grow. And I watered it in fears, night and morning with my tears, and I sunned it with smiles and with soft, deceitful wiles. I always wondered about the twist in this poem. Blake has the speaker willing to tell his anger to his friend, which seems the riskier route, but not tell his anger to his foe. For me, getting noticeably angry at someone I already dislike is really easy. <laughs> Being angry with someone I care about is harder because I want to keep that relationship. I care about the other person's feelings. I want to be seen as trustworthy. We struggle with this in our spiritual community where we all strive to be kind and accepting of one another. When the inevitable disappointments and frustrations come that are always common in community life, the anger readily gets misshapen, sent into indirect communications, sideways comments, a willingness to tell everybody how mad that one person made us except for that one person. Even though most congregations, including ours, have put into place covenants, the promises we make for how we will be in relationship with one another, and even though most of those covenants, including ours, call for us to talk directly with anybody who has angered us, and even though those covenants, including ours, expect us to hang in there and be willing to work through an issue, congregational life everywhere, including here, is filled with sideways communications, triangulation, leaving, rather than working through an issue. And most of those behaviors are chosen deliberately in order to keep the peace in order not to harm anyone. Good-hearted intentions, but intentions that are not only contrary to the promises we make in our covenants, but intentions that don't support healthy, deepening relationships. But Blake has the friend being told the anger and the foe spared in order to hang on to that anger, to cultivate it, to watch it blossom. The poem suggests that we want to rid ourselves of anger at those we love, and so we are sometimes willing to risk telling that anger in order to have it go away. The anger at an enemy, by contrast, is a feeling the poem says we take delight in and have no desire to see dissipated. all truths that Unitarian Universalists again know well and even practice sometimes. We do confront one another sometimes, particularly when we feel at cross purposes with another about a decision made affecting church life. We hope with our confrontations to make a change and be relieved of that unpleasant negativity. Or perhaps even more typically, we confront one another over and over and over again <laughs> in the spirit of discussing, sometimes like a debating society, hoping thereby to work our way through the differences to some bit of common understanding. <clears throat> we tell our wrath to one another, our friends and fellow travelers, and find that in so doing, sometimes it does come to an end. And then, like the scenario in the poem, we have those foes who provoke us and who are spared hearing our anger in order that the anger might be kept intact and nurtured. How many of us have watched this pattern play out in our reactions to political events? have found ourselves stoking the anger we feel, encouraging anger in others, being impatient with anyone who is not angry at the state of public life and political leaders. And how many of us believe that anger is essential if we expect to accomplish real change? And how many of us only spring into action 
when we are really, really angry. Is it any wonder we keep anger close, as Blake suggests? But even before this present time of free-floating, pervasive anger in that very atmosphere we breathe, I've watched how we have other foes who provoke us and who are spared hearing our anger in order that the anger might be kept intact, even nurtured. In the time I've been a Unitarian Universalist, over decades and in different parts of the country, I have seen us define ourselves over and over against the same foes, with the anger not only not dissipating, but blossoming. Our well-loved enemies, I believe, are traditional Christians in many parts of the Christian tradition, and political conservatives. Sometimes I do see us engage them in confrontation, but we're usually the ones who step back and in the confrontation because we don't want to be inappropriately angry. So we politely agree to disagree, and we promptly stop speaking, and we save up the anger until we meet a kindred spirit and can tell them what an impossibly narrow person we just made the mistake of getting into an argument with. Then we shake our heads and resolve anew not to even bother talking to such people since the conversation goes nowhere. And months, years go by and our anger remains righteous, clear. It has become such a part of our tradition that I wonder what would happen to us if we ever lost it if traditional Christians and political conservatives somehow, someday, no longer provoked us? Would we still look like Unitarian Universalists if we could no longer define ourselves as not them? And it grew both day and night till it bore an apple bright and my foe beheld it shine, and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole, when the night had veiled the pole, in the morning, glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. One of the many reasons William Blake found himself ostracized, his poetry trashed during his lifetime, can be seen in the surprising conclusion of this deceptively pretty little poem. The speaker, having kept and nurtured his wrath at his foe, is delighted one morning to discover that his anger has succeeded in killing his foe, which is what we sometimes secretly may hope will happen to our enemies, though unlike Blake, we are way too polite to say so. Instead, we just want them to disappear. Blake said it, and he was vilified as a result. Glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Blake incurred the wrath of his neighbors because the ethic all were supposedly trying to live by is captured in that familiar commandment from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Rather than taking delight in our enemy's downfall and even working to accomplish it, we are to respond to enmity, so Jesus says, with love, goodness, even prayer. All spiritual traditions have some version of this teaching calling for us to abstain from vindictive and hostile responses to perceived slights. Instead of anger and aggression, we're taught in all traditions to respond nonviolently, with <coughs> compassion, with peace and love, which is an impossibly hard ethic to follow. Blake's response nurturing anger and enjoying the comeuppance of enemies is so much easier 
it just comes so much more naturally than the response of love. And yet, I'm happy to tell you this morning that I've learned to do this. <laughs> Which I know makes you even more happy that I'm your interim minister. <laughs> You see, I love enemies. I can make appreciative observations about conservative religion. I advocate for rehabilitation rather than punishment for convicted criminals. I'm learning to challenge those who make racist remarks. I shake my head over the competitive materialism of our culture. I have learned to love enemies provided they're someone else's enemies. <laughs> or enemies on the media. Or abstract enemies. Or enemies who are so very different from me and removed from my daily experience that I can be pretty confident our paths will never cross. The enemies I've not yet learned to love and likely never will learn to love in my lifetime, though I do try are the enemies who are close to me, even kin to me. Those people who think differently than me, hold different opinions from me that nonetheless I have to encounter. Those are the people I find it impossible to love because they're so pig-headed. <laughs> just so wrong in their thinking. <laughs> so why can't they see that and change? My neighbor, he has attractive children, a cute dog, he seems like a bright guy. Why does he have a MAGA bumper sticker on his car? <laughs> My youngest sister is a thoughtful, well-educated person. Why does she subscribe to a fundamentalist version of Christianity. The minister colleague and I, who were such good friends in seminary, why is he so critical of how I use religious language and so offended when I challenge his avoidance of it? I love enemies in general, but these particular enemies who populate my life, the people who have such, or so I believe, absolutely wrong ways of thinking. These are the enemies I struggle unsuccessfully to love. With these enemies, I'm more likely to end up like the speaker in Blake's poem, rejoicing when I get the better of them in an argument, or when I manage to avoid speaking to them at all or when I decide I'll have nothing more to do with them because they're just so wrong. Enemies who see the world differently than me. Those are the enemies I would rather fight than even pretend to love. But the spiritual teachings on enemies and love don't come along with exceptions or special cases. The commandment is absolute, covering everyone and every situation. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who are disrespectful to you, love those who hold different opinions from you, respond with compassion to those who think differently from you. The commandment does not say tolerate them. Tolerance does not suffice. Refusing to speak to the enemy is not an option. Trying to change the enemy's mind is not the desired course of action. No matter the nature of the enemy, no matter the reason for the enmity, the response is to be the same. Love, nonviolence. <coughs> kindness. In the morning, glad I see my foe outstretched beneath the tree. 
our social and political landscape has become so polarized, creating such deep divisions between us that we would rather fight gleefully to the point of destruction, it seems, than even begin to work constructively together with compromises to work together on the overwhelming crises that challenge us. When you see the side you favor winning in some battle over spending cuts or policy issues or military engagements, do you rejoice to see your foe outstretched beneath the tree, vanquished by those who share your position? Or if you're on the losing side these days, will you hold close your anger at the winners and water it with fears and tears, sun it with smiles and wiles until you have just the poison you need to put the winners out of business? Given how polarized our culture is and how all of us in it cannot help but be, I have trouble imagining any other result than what Blake describes. But I want to hope that there's still time. Perhaps any of us, maybe even all of us, can try one more time to love those wrong-headed enemies. Or if we cannot manage to love them, maybe at least we can let some of the anger at them go so that yet one more poison tree of resentment does not take root among us. We already have all the poison trees we need. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>